The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 11690 in the name of Sandra White on NAGMA's 70th anniversary. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate press the request to speak buttons now? I call on Sandra White to open the debate. Ms White, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I also thank the many members who signed the motion, giving it cross-party support and enabling this debate to take place. I also want to, want to thank the many groups who have contacted me and other members about the debate. Some of the representatives are here in the gallery tonight and I welcome to the Scottish Parliament. Thank you very much for your support. <clears throat> Presiding Officer, in the first past 40 hours, we have witnessed the killing of over 50 Palestinian people thousands injured by the Israeli army and members of the international community have condemned the use of live ammunition and tear gas on innocent civilians by the Israeli army. And I add my voice to that condemnation and stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people who have been denied the right to return to their land and their homes, the Nakba. <clears throat> Uh, the, the debate is here to mark the 70th anniversary of the NACBA, and in doing so, I would like to offer some background. I think it was the proper thing to do. There's often a great deal of misunderstanding and misrepresentation, misrepresentation on Palestine, whether it's from individuals, the media or governments, but certain historical facts cannot be altered or dismissed. After the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire in 1914, the British occupied Palestine as part of the sykes pilcott Treaty of 1916 between Britain and France to carve up the Middle East for imperial interests. In 1917, before the start of the British Mandate, 1920 to 1947, the British issued the Balfour Declaration, promising to help the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, essentially vowing to give away a country that was not theirs to give away. In early 1947, the British government announced it would be handing Palestine over to the United Nations and therefore washing its hands of any responsibility to the Palestinian people. On November 29, 1947, the UN adopted Resolution 181 recommending the partition of Palestine into Jewish and Arab states with a special, and this is very important, a special international status for the city of Jerusalem. And that's an important point to make, and I hope Mr Trump and others are listening to that. The proposals were not seen as acceptable, as they went against the principles of the right to self-determination and imposed conditions that were seen as unfair and unworkable. This led to the 1948 conflict, which saw Israeli forces take control of a much larger area of land that was proposed in the UN resolution, and an estimated 700,000 Palestinians fled or were expelled with hundreds of Palestinians, towns and villages depopulated and destroyed. This is an Akbar, and those who fled are still waiting to return. I would like to highlight the stories of two people who lived through this and many more atrocities. Abu Arab owns a tiny store in the main thoroughfare of the market in Nazareth's old city. His shop is a time capsule. On display is a rusting bowl, and inside are hundreds of old coins of a currency no longer recognised. That currency is the Palestinian lira. Abu Arab cherishes his relics as keenly as he does his memories of a home and a way of life he lost when he was 13 years of age and lived in the village of Safuri. Abu Arab tell, recalls events of July 1948 as he was attacked. He said, they bombed us from the air just as we were breaking the fast for Ramadan. They knew we'd all be in our houses. His parents fled with the children, three brothers, including the famous and late poet, Taha Muhammad Ali and a 12-year-old sister. They were forced northwards towards Lebanon. Shortly after they arrived at a refugee camp there, his sister died and his father decided he must make the dangerous journey back home. At the journey's end, they found the village was gone. The area had been fenced off and declared a military zone. And anyone entering risked being shot. He says, we had nothing. Everything had been taken from us. Abu Arab helped to found the main body representing the internal refugees, ADRID, the Association for the Rights of the Internally Displaced, which for the past 30 years has organised an annual Nakba march. Uman Omar was only eight when her family was expelled from the hometown of Jasur in 1958, 48, sorry, and landed in Jabalia refugee camp in the northern Gaza Strip. The refugee camp was established by the United Nations Agency for Palestinian Refugees, for an estimated 35,000 people who were evicted from their area. 
Today, however, the camp is the largest in the besieged coastal enclave with more than 110,000 refugees living there. The pain of displacement has never ended for this family. They lived through three Israeli military offences in Gaza since 2009. Like tens of thousands of Palestinians across the narrow coastal enclave, Omar's home was destroyed by Israeli airstrikes during the 51-day offences in Gaza in 2014. Several years ago, the, the couple buried their home deeds and keys, and this is also important because these keys mean such a lot to the Palestinian people. They buried in a location that only the children know, hoping that they'd be able to return to their home one day. And he said, as he said, I still hope that I'll die in my hometown. I may be using a walker to move around today, but if they told me I could go back, I'd run all the way. What a man. It's estimated there are 7.98 million Palestinian refugees and displaced people who cannot go back to their houses. The Gaza Strip, 2 million Palestinians live, has been under Israeli siege for more than a decade, whereby Israel controls the airspace, sea, borders. The Strip has also witnessed three Israeli assaults that have made the area close to uninhabitable. Many people are quick to criticise nations that violate UN resolutions or do not abide by international law. I think that's quite right. And I believe that if we fail to acknowledge what Israel has been doing in Palestine and where Israel is concerned, we fail to present the situation honestly. And we fail to be taken seriously by the rest of the world. And I noticed just about 10 minutes ago, the UK government had put, issued out a statement calling for greater restraint from Israel. That's an insult, an insult to every single Palestinian who's been killed and injured in the past not just 48 hours, but years. An absolute insult. And we must make sure that we have our voices heard. So let us be clear, regardless of the history, I believe the way forward, the only way to achieve a lasting peace is to recognise Palestine's state, along with an Israeli one. That was not possible in 47, but for me and many others, it's the only viable option to go into just now. Now let us be clear that the time is now. The time is not tomorrow or next year or some point in the future, it is now. People are dying every single day. We can't continue to bury our heads in the sand. It's time for the UK to join other UN member states and recognise the state of Palestine. It's morally incumbent on the UK to take that step, given its involvement and its resulting culpability for the current situation. From the time when Britain administered Palestine after the First World War until it abandoned it in 1948, resulting in the Nakba, our involvement in Palestine has been quite shameful. From the promises of an independent Palestinian state to refusing to support UN efforts for a two-state solution leading to the 1948 war and the subsequent loss of Palestinian lands, our actions have loomed large over the history of Palestine. It's time for our actions to loom large over the future of Palestine. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Ms. White. I call Ivan McKee to be followed by Morris Golden. Mr. McKee, please. Doesn't appear to. We thought he'd pressed his button. We've misread it. He has pressed his button. Where's Mr. McKee? He's not here. Oh, oh sorry. I've called you, Mr. McKee. Sorry. Oh, dearie. You need to. Um, I was beginning to think I was taking a wee turn here, officer. Mr. McKee. <laughs> Ivan McKee to be followed by Morris Gold. I did call him, didn't I? I didn't. <laughs> Thank you. I've got some allies. <laughs> I'm a McKee to be followed by Morris Golden. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. And thank you very much to Sandra White for bringing this hugely important debate to the Chamber this evening. And of course, our thoughts today are with the, uh, the families of those um, killed by the Israeli forces over the last few days. Um, and uh, the very sad situation, tragic situation that's developing in Gaza. Um, the, the, the Nakba, or the catastrophe, uh, as it's called by the Palestinians, as Sandra White um, has explained, was the events that happened 70 years ago when more than 700,000 Palestinians were evicted, forced from their land and from their homes. Uh, more than 500 villages and towns destroyed, uh, and the descendants of those Palestinians still living 
uh, in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, um, and across the globe. And while those events were 70 years ago, they're still very much, very much alive today as the tragic events of, of, of yesterday and, and over the last few weeks have demonstrated with the Palestinian people making clear their determination to one day return to the homes from which they were expelled. Uh, and, and Gaza is very much a consequence of the night, but more than 50% of the population living in Gaza are refugees from, from the events of 70 years ago. And that ethnic cleansing that happened 70 years ago, let's be clear, still continues um, every day uh, 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 through, uh, through, the, through to the present. And uh, when I was in, uh, visited Palestine, my first trip to Palestine very recently, um, I witnessed very much at first hand the, the events that continue to unfold day by day. I was taken uh, uh, to the South Hebron Hills by an organization called Breaking the Silence, um, who are an organization formed of um, ex-Israeli veterans from the Israeli army who are uh, making a stand to state that the things that they were asked to do while they were in the army were unacceptable and making it public to the population in Israel and internationally um, of the, 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 the unacceptable um, things that the army, the Israeli army are expected to carry out in the uh, occupied territories day by day. Um, we visited the visit or, uh, village of Susia, where the residents on no less than six occasions over the last 70 years have had their, their homes destroyed and have been moved on only to return back um, and, and, and rebuild uh, and try to carry on their lives. That's in what's called Area C of the, uh, of the West Bank, the area that's under Israeli military control. Right next to uh, the Palestinian villages there are, are of course, the illegal, illegal Israeli settlements. Um, and uh, the, the army, the Israeli army is there, not to police the situation, but with a very clear intent of protecting the, uh, the settlers and doing whatever is required to make life as difficult as possible for the Palestinians that live there. Uh, we witnessed um, Palestinians trying to farm on their land and plant, plant trees there and been thrown off uh, in front of our eyes by, by the army. The army creates so-called military zones for the specific purpose of preventing Palestinians to, uh, to farm there, again, throwing them off their land, destroys the water system so the Palestinian villagers can't, uh, can't continue their agricultural business um, on the land that they, they own. I met with medical aid for Palestinians who are here today and they explained the, the situation on the Israeli checkpoints for 57 um, Palestinians had died uh, in, in the last year trying to get to hospital, but stopped by the Israeli army from, from doing so. And I met with B'Tselem, I'm a very uh, um, effective and brave Israeli uh, human rights organization that document across the occupied territories the human rights abuses that are carried out, um, carried out by, the, the, by the, the occupying forces. Um, I think that the time I've got available just, just to wind up, it's clear that the situation is getting worse, that the, the, the actions by the Trump administration are I mean, disgraceful in creating a, identifying Jerusalem as a capital of, uh, of Israel. That's only going to make the situation worse. And now is the time, as Sandra White said, for internationally, um, from message from this Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government, uh, from the UK Government, from the European Union, from others internationally, that the time has come to end the ethnic cleansing of Palestine and to move towards a just peace in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. McKee. I call Maurice Golden to be followed by Anna Sarwar. Mr. Golden, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Let me begin by paying my respects to the many people tragically killed and injured during the protests in Jerusalem. It is important that we re remember such events lest they become lost in the cycle of violence that sadly plagues the region. These latest violent clashes serve as a reminder of how volatile the Middle East is. Centuries of anger and conflict have led us to the present where Israelis and Palestinians share an uneasy coexistence. It is that legacy of conflict and strife that we are here to debate today. But we must also look to the future and the hope for rapprochement. I do not have time in such a short speech to recount the entire history of conflict and dispute between Israelis and Palestinians, nor in this particular debate would it be appropriate to do so. However, it is important to recognize that the two peoples share an intertwined history. 
recognising just one aspect of that history, whether it be from a pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinian viewpoint, does both a disservice. Just as hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were displaced from their homes in the 1948 war, so too did hundreds of thousands of Jew, Jews flee from Arab states to the newly created state of Israel. Both occurred against a backdrop of war that claimed thousands of lives. Yes. I will not attempt to draw equivalence between suffering and loss, but I point out that Israelis and Palestinians are two people linked by the same tragic events. If we want to see the cycle of anger and violence broken, we must acknowledge that link, that shared tragedy. In that light, we must recognize that the motion only tells half the story. It refers to the generations of pain felt by the Palestinian people, and so do I. But we should also recognize the generation of fear felt by the Israelis who have also found themselves under attack. The United Kingdom rightly favors a two-state solution. If we are to seriously champion the cause of the Palestinian people to live in their own state of peace and security, we must also champion the right of Israel to exist and be free from attack. Both causes are equally valid. Israel was born amidst war, but it has come through adversity as an established democracy in the Middle East. Of course, Israel is not perfect, nor should we defend every action of the Israeli government. Israel does show the world, however, that a free and democratic society governed by the rule of law is possible in the Middle East. It is important that we remember the suffering and loss on both sides, but we cannot be bound by the darkness of the past if we want a brighter future for both Israel and Palestine. Thank you, Mr. Golden. I call Anna Sarwar to be followed by Ross Greer, please. Mr. Sarwar. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I actually wasn't intending in speaking in the debate, but to, to listen to the debate because I support everything that Sandra and I'm sure many others were, were going to speak uh, about. And I want to congratulate Sandra White for bringing forward um, this motion and this debate. But I have been so struck emotionally by what I have seen in recent days that I feel angry, helpless, and broken, and I know that's a feeling shared by millions of people in our country here, but tens of millions of people right around the world. Because the events of the last few days will have lasting consequences. The opening of the US Embassy in Jerusalem is a direct and deliberate threat to any chance of peace. It's a deliberate attempt to kill any hope of a peace process and it is a deliberate attempt to kill any chance of a genuine two-state solution. It has been a deliberate act to inflame and escalate tensions, not to de-escalate tensions. And the events in Gaza prove that. 50 people have been killed, including women and children. Over 2,000 people have been injured. And this is not an isolated case on one day. This is an ongoing crisis every single day. And to put it into stark contrast, can you imagine if the city of Glasgow was surrounded by a wall with limited people allowed in, with limited supplies allowed in, with no one allowed out, and we had intermittent firing of rockets and missiles into it? What would be the reaction of fellow Scots? What would be the reaction of the international community? But well, that's what's happening to the people of Gaza every single day. It's the death of humanity that's happening in Gaza and the West Bank. And we have got to stand up and speak out about it. Because the reality is that Donald Trump is not an honest broker for peace. He has broken that chance of peace. And where is the international community? The so-called international community that we all all say the international community needs to send out condemnation. The international community needs to come together. The international community needs to start a peace process. There is no such thing as the international community when we see international horrific incidents happening 
like this. We talk about the peace process. There is no peace process to revive. There is no peace and there is no process. And every single day that we waste makes the chance of achieving a two-state solution less and less likely. To be frank, shame on us. Shame on all of us. Shame on every single person right across the international community that allows this tragedy to go on day after day after day. Innocent people deny their basic rights of access to clean water, access to food, access to employment, access to any kind of peace or justice or access to democracy. Things that we take for granted every single day. I've been to the Gaza Strip. Two thirds of the population only eat because of UN food programs. One third of essential medicines listed by the World Health Organization aren't available to the people of Gaza. This is a tragedy in our world on our watch and we should all be collectively ashamed of ourselves. I'm sick of condemnation when bad events happen. Condemnation is no longer enough. We need to wake up as a genuine international community and act because if we don't, the legacy that we leave behind is one of shame on the entire global family that we allegedly live in. I call Ross Greer to be followed by Polly McNeill. Mr Greer, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to my co-convener of this Parliament's cross-party group on Palestine, Sandra White, for ensuring that we're able to mark the NACBA in the Scottish Parliament today. Well, did we realise when we were discussing preparations for today at the CPG that this debate would prove so tragically timely? Though Israel's barbarity is of no surprise to anyone with even a passing understanding of how their state came into being or its actions in each and every year since, many of us had hoped with the world's eyes on them yesterday, even if for nothing more than PR purposes, Israel might show some restraint. In hindsight, it was stupid to expect as much from an Israeli state which has not for years seen Palestinian people as people, which places no value on their lives. Yesterday, Israeli soldiers gunned down more than 60 Palestinians protesting on, for their right to exist on their land. They injured thousands more. They killed six children and at least one paramedic. In the weeks since the Great March of Return protest began, they've killed almost 100 demonstrators, including Ibrahim Abu Tharaya, who lost both his legs to previous Israeli airstrikes and was shot dead in his wheelchair. And photojournalist Yasir Mataja, he was shot wearing a protective vest that clearly marked him out as press. After murdering him, the Israeli government propaganda machine spun into place. It claimed he was a high-ranking member of Hamas. Before concocting this story, they hadn't bothered to find out the first thing about him. If they had, they'd known he'd previously been arrested and beaten by Hamas. He'd cleared American government vetting to receive grants from an aid agency. He was no threat. He was no extremist. He was a journalist doing his job. They have no hesitation lying and spreading misinformation in attempts to get away with their crimes. Now, given it's our year of young people here in Scotland, I'll take this opportunity to show our solidarity with the children and the young people of Palestine, especially those in Gaza, born long after the Nakba and still suffering from its consequences. Fully half of Gaza's population are under the age of 18. Over a decade into its siege, the UN estimates that over 300,000 of them need psychological support. They are so traumatised by the atrocities that have been inflicted upon them. During the 2014 assault on Gaza, over 500 children were killed by Israel. That included four boys from one family. They were playing football on the beach when they were shelled by the Israeli Navy. Clearly children, clearly not a threat. They weren't hit by a single stray shell. They were deliberately attacked. As they fled across the beach, the Israeli ship adjusted its aim and fired a second shell, killing them all. Their names were Ismail Mohammed Bakir, he was nine. Zakaria Ahed Bakir, he was 10. Ahed Atef Bakir, he was 10 and Mohammed Ramez Bakir, he was 11. Their deaths were recorded by the world's media. They were 200 meters away in their own hotel. Many of those journalists put themselves at risk and did all they could to save those children and the two others who were wounded with them. And the Israeli government spokesperson sent out to spin this all away was of course Mark Regev, now the Israeli ambassador to the UK. From what I can tell, there really is no war crime too heinous for Mr Regev to struggle spinning it. Israel is the only country in the world to summarily prosecute children through a military court system. And not Israeli children, of course, just Palestinian children. Those who object to Israel being labelled an apartheid state should look no further than the situation in the West Bank, where two legal systems exist. Morris Golden mentioned Israel being a country with the rule of law. Two rules of law. 
And the legal system you're subjected to depends on nothing more than your nationality and your ethnicity. If you're a Palestinian living in that Palestinian territory, you'll be subjected to Israeli military court systems which deny your basic fundamental rights. If you're an illegal Israeli settler, you will fall under Israel's civ uh, civilian legal system. Israel's apartheid system goes far beyond the walls that they build. Just ask the five to 700 Palestinian children arrested and prosecuted under that military court system every year. Three in four of them are physically abused by their captors. One in four is forced to sign documents in Hebrew, a language they don't even speak. Israel is not a beacon of decency and democracy. It is a colonial occupier. It is an apartheid state. It is an abuser of children. We must reject the false equivalence of those who try to obscure Israel's crimes by framing this as a conflict between equal sides. Palestine has no army, no navy, no air force. For much of the day, Gaza doesn't even have electricity and barely any running water. While Israel relies on massive economic and military aid packages from the US and UK, Palestinians rely on our international solidarity and that of those inside Israel, like breaking the silence that Ivan McKee mentioned, whose work should be admired. But this is why the boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign is so important. Just as apartheid South Africa became an international pariah, so too must apartheid Israel. We cannot stand by and allow these crimes to go unanswered. We must put pressure on every business, every organization which supports the occupation until they withdraw. The people of Palestine deserve to be free and here in Scotland we must do all that we can to help them achieve that. Uh, can I say just before I call Paul McNeill, due to the number of members still wishing to speak in the debate, I'm minded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 that debate is extended by up to 30 minutes. Can I invite Sandra White to move the motion, please? The motion. The question is that under Rule 8.14.3, the debate is extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we agreed? We are agreed. I then call Paul McNeill to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Ms McNeill, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin by thanking Sandra White for securing this debate to ensure that this day does not go unmarked. Al-Nakba, the catastrophe, is a crime the world should never forget. It is not just an event, but at a point in history which caused the conflict, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It was a crime against humanity, a crime against the Palestinians, and yes, there are two sides. It should be taught to our children in our schools and it should be taught as part of the history lessons for that reason. The world has remained largely silent since certainly and ineffective in challenging Israel, the only party in this conflict who can make any real concessions to the Palestinians. The event of the 15th of May 1948 involved the systematic and violent removal of Palestinians from their homelands, expelled them, colonised their land, annexed their territory. So Yarun, Bint, Jabil, Haifa, Jaffa, Lubia, just some of the names of the Palestinian villages taken by force, and we know that there are more than 500. The refugees that ended up in Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, dispersed around the world, live in the worst conditions and I know many of my colleagues have been there to see them for themselves. In Shatila camp in Beirut, which I visited last year, young men and women could only dream of a future because they have no rights in the countries of which they're refugees. And a young woman I spoke to last year who's desperate to be a doctor can't really achieve her dream because she has no rights in Lebanon where she lives in a refugee camp. There can be no settlement without a solution to the rights of refugees to return to their homeland. As more than 80% of the Palestinian population lost their homeland and were expropriated without compensation. They have still not had justice. As we've heard from other speakers, Gaza is described as a prison and is now in its 11th year of blockade. It is unlivable. It only has a few hours of electricity every day. And now it's been said that by 2021, Gaza will not be viable. So if you want to ask questions about why it is that Palestinians are peacefully protesting now on the border between Gaza and Israel, it's because they live in a prison, they live in blockade by land and by sea, and which the world does nothing about. In the West Bank, Palestinians live under occupation with no rights and daily suffering. And as Ross Greer has said, there is no equal treatment for Palestinians. They do not have citizenship. 
Any Jewish person anywhere in the world can come even to the West Bank occupied territory and claim citizenship. But my friends from Jerusalem who do not have citizenship and whose family come from Jerusalem cannot get citizenship. There is no equality. Repeated UN resolutions have been ignored by Israel. No state actor stands up to Israel. It's resolution 194, just to name but one, the right of return where it says, a person shall not be subject to arrest or detention or exile. Um, but these resolutions are continually ignored. In fact, the Israeli first Israeli cabinet passed an emergency regulation one day after the adoption of, one, of resolution 194 to legalize and the permitting of all Palestinian property of those who were absent, who fled the violence in 1948 to be confiscated. And sadly, that is the character of the state of Israel. So this question is not about the right of the state of Israel to exist, but it is about the character of Israel and how it has evolved 70 years later. Noam Chomsky, who I do admire, whilst addressing the UN, said that many of the world's problems are intractable, but that the palestine israel conflict is one of the solvable problems of the world. And he was the first person to observe, as Anasawa rightly says, that the peace talks were never meant to reach a destination. They are to perpetuate a situation of no solution. And it's very important to understand this point. A close presiding officer, if you want me to. We've witnessed some dreadful scenes, dreadful scenes in Gaza in the last few days. 58 Palestinians killed dead. And I'd say to Maurice Golden and others, um, I appreciate we don't have the same view, but surely as a human being, you can see that these are unarmed protesters and that they should, the actions of Israel and its army should be condemned outright. In the Gaza hospitals right now, they just do not have enough operating theatres to attend to the injured. I am struck with a number of Israelis, young people of all ages who are appalled by the actions of their own state, a state that they love and believe in, the only way to ensure peace in the Middle East is for a third party, not the United States, to be an interlocutor, an interlocutor to find an independent Palestinian state alongside a state Israel. But I finish on this. If no state actor is prepared to challenge Israel's behavior and how it conducts its business, and the fact that it makes no concessions in the peace process to the Palestinians. Unfortunately, this conflict will go on for another 70 years, and shame on the international community for doing nothing to stand up to Israel. Thank you. Thank you. I call Ruth McGuire to be followed by John Finney. Ms. McGuire, please. Presiding officer, I congratulate my colleague Sandra White in securing this debate and thank her for her long-standing and unwavering commitment in highlighting the injustices suffered by the Palestinian people at the hands of Israel. We're here this evening marking the 70th anniversary of the Nakba, but the Nakba, or the catastrophe, didn't really start or end in 1948. The mass eviction of over 750,000 men, women and children from historic Palestinian land the destruction of over 500 towns and villages. The Palestinian people were being forcibly removed from their land before the 15th of May, and still today, 70 years later, generations know the pain of displacement, the pain of protracted conflict, and the pain of a prolonged, vicious Israeli occupation, punctuated by frequent incidents of calculated, cowardly violence. Incidents which we all bore witness to again yesterday. This is state-sponsored violence carried out against children as well as adults. And shame on those who describe it as clashes, presiding officer. None of us, not a single one of us, are fooled by that term clashes when, described what's, when describing what's been happening over the last few days. Quite simply, this is a massacre. There is no justification for. And I fear that the actions of the so-called superpowers and the UK's impotent response simply mean that we've never been further from justice, that we've never been further, further from peace. I can't have been the only one sickened by the grotesque pictures of US dignitaries' decadent backslapping celebration of their embassy opening in Jerusalem as snipers fired at unarmed civilians, maiming and killing. It was a massacre. Medical aid for Palestine state that Palestinians living under occupation or blockade in the occupied Palestinian territories 
or as refugees in Lebanon, are subject to intolerable stress in every aspect of their daily lives. Lack of access to health services, settler violence, threat of home demolition, unemployment and trauma caused by conflict and displacement are all facts of daily life. Over 4 million displaced people were registered by the UN as refugees and unable to return home. A constituent of mine has Palestinian family in Jordan. He tells me that the children have asked their grandpa there many times why he didn't stay. And he tells them that they were so worried, they knew what was being done, and they fled in all directions. The mass eviction of se over 750,000 men, women, and children, the destruction of over 500 towns and villages. He believed it was only temporary and that they would be home soon. Four generations have passed and they're still exiled. Still there is no justice and still we are far from peace. Presiding officer, I almost can't bring myself to imagine how despairing the seeming absence of any prospect of peace, freedom or justice must be. It is absolutely heartbreaking. The old are still alive and the young will never forget. And we won't forget here in Scotland either. There are many local organisations campaigning for justice for Palestine, like the Ayrshire Palestine Forum, who this, mar who this month marched um, with the Trades Councils on May to raise awareness and hold regular stalls and events. Find your local group and support them. There are national demonstrations taking place this weekend. Those in the west of Scotland might like to join me on the 19th of May in Glasgow. And if you can't join a group, if you can't join a demo, you can take action as an individual. Boycott, divestment and sanctions are a legitimate, peaceful action to take. It has worked before against apartheid and it can work again. Boycott Israeli goods, encourage divestment in Israeli companies and contact your MPs and the, and the UK government and urge sanctions against this racist apartheid state. We have to build a wave of support for Palestine that can't be ignored. Finally, I just encourage everyone who cares about peace and justice to take action and do all that they can. Thank you. I call John Finney to be followed by James Dorn and Mr Finney, uh, please. Thank you, President Officer. I too would like to congratulate my, my friend and colleague, um, Sandra White, for uh, all her efforts uh, on behalf of the Palestinian people and for bringing this motion here. I think it's very important that we remember 70 years on and every day has been a day of misery for, for people there. And it's important that we don't forget the role the UK played in that. We can't rewrite history and of course history will show us that um, a bullying state will remove a group of people from their own homes and land. They will seize those homes and land and put their own people in them. They'll imprison and abuse the original occupants. That's what the Nazis did. That's what happened under Stalin's uh, Soviet Union. And that's what's happening on a, <coughs> excuse me, on a daily basis in the apartheid state of Israel. And that's an appropriate term. And the gentleman who compiled that term in a UN report and was hounded around this planet for, for evidencing the fact that Israel is an apartheid the state is an example of the bullying that goes on. So I unreservably condemn that inhumanity. And I'm surprised why a group of people um, will only be prepared to uh, condemn two of these three uh, um, categories that I mentioned there. And I also condemn violence. I think everyone has the right to defend themselves. I do condemn violence. Um, but underlying causes of that conflict must be recognized and must be looked at. Most of all, in this chamber, I have the opportunity to condemn apologists. Um, Mr. Golden told us he came here to debate. He didn't come to debate. He could have taken the opportunity to engage in debate. What he's done is he's kept his head down and he's read his pre-prepared speech. I don't know who's written it for him. What, of course, happened with the intake of August 20, uh, um, of, uh, 2016 was that um, whilst many of us were looking after our constituents or concerned about issues around the planet, a group of the conservative intake went to um, Israel. I'll tell you what their leader, uh, John Lamont, said. I quote, I look forward to exploring ways we can further these political, cultural, and economic ties with the Jewish state. Well, I have to tell you, I'm not alone in finding that term offensive. Um, and what they did do when they were there was they took the opportunity to do a bit of sightseeing. And I know you don't like props, so I'm not going to hold up the picture. But if I tell you, presiding officer, that Messrs. Mundell, Ross, Lamont, McInnes, Thompson, Lockhart, um, Green, and uh, along with Miss uh, Wells and Miss Hamilton and Mr. Morris Golden are pictured. 
They're pictured at the West Bank Wall, which was erected in 2007. Um, it's a violation of international law with International Court of Justice. And they're all standing there grinning profusely with the military officer who built the wall. What a tremendous propaganda success for that vile regime, handed to them on a plate. Um, now, I respect international law. It's evident that the, the Conservatives don't. Um, and uh, I also am prepared to condemn anyone involved in violence. So um, there's a lot of concern about state media control that uh, emanates from Russia. The killing of journalists is a factor there. Well, of course, we know that that's exactly the same in Israel, and people who are prepared to condemn Russia on that basis should be prepared to condemn Israel. Because we've heard from many speakers, there's been a, 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 an intentional targeting of people who have tried to record this. Innocent people with uh, press vests being shot. Um, now, um, there's many fine people uh, in Israel, and I think in previous speeches I've mentioned the, the respected war correspondent, Gideon Levy, who was vilified for documenting in his analytical form, what he saw in Gaza, just as he had done in the Chechnya and just as he had done in the Balkan conflict. Um, like others, I visited Gaza uh, in 2012 with my uh, colleague, uh, Claudia Beamish. It is a human prison. Now, I find it particularly galling that the Conservative Party will condemn a government giving the provision of a baby box to a family, <laughs> but have nothing, nothing to say on babies in Gaza being denied electricity, food, sustenance, shelter, and most of all, a future. I think it's your, to your eternal shame. And of course, what we do know, what we do know about Gaza, it's, it's a very, very successful live test ground for the munitions of Israel's very successful arms industry. But I want to be positive. I do think uh, justice will prevail. I do think individuals that deserve and, and, and clearly um, the Conservative benches find that amusing. I don't think there's anything amusing about justice for real. It does catch up in folk. It caught up on the Nazis and it will catch up in this present regime. Um, the people will be taken to trial and, and they'll get their opportunity to, to say they're going to be defended. People have um, talked about the keys and I think they're a very, very wonderful symbol. I think these keys will yet be used to gain access, gain access to houses. But I say again that history will judge very harshly those who have colluded, promoted, appeased and denied. Um, and um, so the online bullying that participants in this debate will have at the conclusion of this debate, because that's the way things work, people come out the woodwork, or very nice, mild-mannered wee women want to come and see you and harass you, um, and because uh, that, that's the way that it works. That's how it worked with Nazi Germany. That's how it worked with Stalin. That's how it worked with Pol Pot. That's how it works with this regime. So let's not forget, it's important. There are many things that could be said. I'm sure you'll tell me to, 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 to be quiet. What I want and what is required is the fulfillment of international law in something approaching humanitarian norms. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. I hope I'm allowing members' generosity with their time in the debate. So, uh, whoever's speaking, can I call James Dornan to be followed by Claudia Beamish, please? Mr. Dornan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I start off by uh, congratulating Sandra White and bringing this to the Chamber today? As, as was said, I think, by Ross Greer earlier on, the timing could not have been more horrifically apt than, than uh, it, it turned out today. There's lots that's been said about the, the Nakba, and I don't think I, I want to go over that, except for to say that if that happened today, we wouldn't be calling it a catastrophe, we'd be calling it ethnic cleansing, because that's exactly what they did. They ethnically cleansed. I have been, I've, I've not been to Palestine yet. We, we, we were hoping to arrange a trip once and I had to get cancelled late on. But I have been to areas that have gone through similar things. Like I've been to Uganda and South Sudan. I've been to Serbia where I've, I've met Syrian refugees. So obviously there's two connections there with the, the Bosnian conflict. I'm going to Srebrenica very shortly. And you wonder to yourself, how do you get to such a place? And you can't do it if you see the other person as the same as you. And what we are seeing in Israel is what has happened in some of these conflicts across the world, that they do not, the Israeli government do not perceive the Palestine people as being equal to the Israeli people. If they did, they couldn't possibly treat them in the way that they're treating them just now. I mean, I watched some of those scenes. It would just break your heart. There was a, a baby died today from tear gas. Now, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm fairly confident that child was not trying 
to climb over the wall or go through the wires. Just like that guy in the wheelchair that, that, that uh, Ross was, was talking about earlier on. These are not people who are trying to invade Israel. These are not people who are putting others at risk. These are innocent people who are being murdered, slaughtered, massacred by the Israeli state. And I do not think it's incumbent of anybody from this parliament to come here and admit, to be fair to, to, to Maurice Golden, admit a bit shamefacedly, get up and defend the Israeli state because they should not be defended. I, you, we were talking, Maurice Golden was talking about uh, two sides to this and there are and there's some terrible things have happened to the people of Israel. But I think in the last year, you could count on the one hand the amount of people who, and that's five too many if it is that, who have died through the conflict. Probably while we've been having this speech, you could say the same amount of people will probably have been killed at the, at the conflict just now. There is, there's got to be an equivalence. There's got to be moral equivalence. There's got to be legal equivalence. The Tories are meant to be the party of the rule of law. But it seems that when it comes to Israel, just like with Trump and with the other, the, the major forces in this world, we turn a blind eye to it. We need to make sure, we've talked very, very, very powerful speeches from Anna Sarwar and many others today. We need to make sure that the international community, if it's going to mean anything at all, stands up to the bully boys of Israel, tells Trump to get out his box, go back and build another hotel and leave the world to grow in peace. Because what he did yesterday was quite shameful. And as has been said earlier, was deliberate. Do you know that yesterday, the Israeli government asked the, the mosque near the American, new American embassy if they could tone down the call to prayer during the celebrations. I mean, seriously, that's how insignificant they see the Palestines, the Muslim population of Israel. Please think about this. The Conservatives, everybody in this place should be thinking about how we can move forward together to make this life better for everybody and not the way it is just now where there's some here who count and there's a big swathe of people who don't count and that is not the way that we should be thinking about in this parliament or the world should be in general. Let's get behind the people of Palestine. Let's get that two-state solution sorted and let's do it as soon as we possibly can. Thank you. I call Claudia Beamish, the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Beamish, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And um, I declare an interest as a co-convener of the cross-party group for Palestine, along with Sandra White and Ross Greer. And I want to start with a very heavy heart by thanking Sandra White for her motion and the opportunity to debate today on the 70th anniversary of the Nakba. A heavy heart because this motion recognises a day of mourning which should not be happening. It is also a shameful day for the Israeli state whose actions over all this time have caused untold suffering and that there, there is much uh, that breaks with the tenets of international law in that as well. It is also a day of disbelief for me and so many others across the world, disbelief that United States president has shown such total disrespect for a whole displaced, persecuted and imprisoned people. Yes, imprisoned in what should be their own land by moving the American embassy from the capital, Tel Aviv, to Jerusalem, which is a holy city for Christians, Muslims and Jews alike, and thus totally inappropriate as a capital city for anybody. As reported in the New York Times of the 7th of December last year, and I quote, all but two of 11 former US ambassadors to Israel contacted by the newspaper after President Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital thought the plan was wrong-headed, dangerous, or deeply flawed. Today is also a day to recognize that many Jewish people in Israel and across the world support a just solution for Palestinians. This is symbolized for me by the handing out of flowers to Arab and Palestinian residents by some 200 activists in the old city of Jerusalem, ahead of the flag march, as it's known now, a mass rally of thousands of Jewish nationalists that has been criticized and indeed, in my view, is provocative. However, this is also further a day of deplorable deja vu for me and for so many others. I grew up knowing Palestinian exiles when I lived in London as a child 
and I visited Lebanon with my father when I was aged 15. He was then a politician and saw the refugee camps alongside me. That was 40 years ago. And now, today, the Nak Nak Nakba or mourning recognizes 70 years since the start of this shameful story. As many in this chamber and beyond will know, there are five million Palestinian exiles forced out of their lands into camps and other countries across our planet. And we have heard about Gaza City as well. John Finney and I uh, and many others here um, visited Gaza City in many in, um, over the years. And I have signed his recent motion about Israel being an apartheid state. Uh, having visited the occupied territories, territories in 2012, we witnessed schools and homes bombed in totally disproportionate attacks by the Israeli state, shortages of medical supplies in hospitals. We saw desperate shortage, shortages there and dependence on the UN food aid and bottled water due to the Israeli blockade of Gaza. My debate in this chamber when um, my friend and colleague John Finney came back was named thirsting for justice and there is still no justice. Now, as reflected in Sandra White's earlier motion about Land Day, 17 um, unarmed Palestinian protesters were killed by Israeli forces as they tried to show their frustration and, yes, fury at the illegal occupation of their intergenerational homeland. And more, of course, have been injured since that day. And so we come to yesterday. At least 58 Palestinian protesters dead and over 2,000 injured. And Anas Sawa's motion of today notes the UN High Commission for Human Rights who stated, those responsible for outrageous human rights violations must be held to account. And I want also to thank Ivan McKee because today medical aid for Palestine uh, was at the drop-in here in the Scottish Parliament. And I ask all here today and beyond this chamber to consider supporting this charity, uh, which does such robust medical work against deplorable conditions on women's health and on a whole range of medical issues, trying to save lives as well today from those who were injured yesterday. There is for sure a 2018 sense of international community, but where is the global responsibility that really must help to find a solution for what has been a 70-year-old injustice? and Scotland and Britain must play their part. And I do ask the Scottish Government today to consider protesting about the present deplorable disproportionate actions of the Israeli state and to demand in the strongest terms that Israel recommences the negotiations with the Pal Palestinians to create a Palestinian state and a fair and secure so solution for all those concerned, wherever they may be. And I understand my colleague and friend Pauline McNeil has just highlighted to me that the UN Security Council is currently holding an emergency meeting to discuss the Gaza protests. The indomitable Palestinian people will not give up the keys. This, this, this must not pass to another generation. It is time for them to go home. And the international community and everyone in this chamber and throughout Scotland and Britain must help to make sure that we play our part to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I now call on uh, Dr Alistair Allen to close the government. Minister, please. Thanks, Presiding Officer. I uh, welcome this debate to recognise the 70th anniversary of the Nakba, known as we've heard by the Palestinian people as the Day of Catastrophe. And I thank all the members who have taken part uh, in this debate, and particularly, as others have done, like to thank Sandra White for raising the motion in Parliament tonight. It is as well to remember the horrors that we commemorate. In 1948, there were 750,000 evictions and 4 million refugees. And we can hardly ignore the horrors of this week either, a point which many members uh, have made eloquently. Now, yes, Mr. Golden, uh, there has, of course, been violence on both sides in the past and the history of this conflict. But this week we have seen an escalation of violence uh, by the Israeli government uh, and the highest death rates that we've seen in the region since 2014. Following the recent protests along the Gaza border, there has been appalling state-sponsored violence leading to large-scale loss of life and thousands 
of injured, including, as we have heard, children. The Scottish Government, as uh, I think this Parliament does also, urges for every effort to be made to prevent further escalation. And in particular, all possible steps must be taken to protect children along this border. And can I say to anyone who wishes to be more equivocal about that, we either specifically condemn the, ch the killing of children or we don't. And I hope that that is a message that leaves this Parliament today. And so I echo the words of the First Minister yesterday, condemning the appalling violence and urging international law to be upheld and human rights to be respected. I would also like to reiterate the words of the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Tourism and External Affairs, Fiona Hislop, who last night condemned the Israeli government's absolutely excessive use of force against civilians. The use of force on this scale against civilians has to be unjustifiable. I add my own condemnation of the Israeli government's actions to the condemnation which has been heard from around this chamber and from around the world. Now, the Cabinet Secretary is writing to the UK Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson, to express the Scottish Government's shock over the loss of life, uh, her own dismay over the totally disappropriate, disproportionate uh, response of the Israeli Government, and to ask the UK Government to do all it can to urge an immediate solution to the violence and also to play a full role in re-establishing a meaningful peace process. And the Cabinet Secretary will, to pick up on a point made by a number of speakers tonight, also uh, be seeking confirmation from the UK Government that it certainly does not intend to move its own embassy to Jerusalem. Presiding officer, consider this. Yesterday alone, 58 Palestinians were killed and thousands more were injured. Protesters streamed to the frontier for the climax of a six-week demonstration, and this coincided with the US preparing, as we have heard, to open its embassy in Jerusalem. The decision that the US president took on Jerusalem was by any reasonable assessment reckless, wrong, and a direct th threat to the peace process in the Middle East. That is why the decision was rightly condemned across the international community. And to bring us back to where Sandra White began this debate, uh, I want to say that uh, the status of Jerusalem can only be determined in a negotiated settlement between Israelis and Palestinians. And ultimately, uh, of course, Jerusalem should be the shared capital of the Israeli and Palestinian states. That is an important principle and starting point in any quest for peace. Presiding officer, in conclusion, the Scottish government strongly encourages the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority to work with the international community on securing long-term peace and ending the heartbreaking cycle of violence which continues to affect both Palestinians and Israelis. But above all, we must, as a parliament, take this opportunity to call directly on the Israeli government to stop the wildly excessive and totally unjustifiable use of force against civilians. So we condemn the reckless decision to open the US Embassy in Jerusalem at the very height of tensions on the Israel-Gaza border. The region needs a considered, balanced, strategic approach to building trust and peace. The opening of the US Embassy in Jerusalem has only served to increase distrust and make a long-term peaceful solution less likely. The Scottish Government, like many others, supports the EU position of a two-state solution based on the 1967 borders and firmly encourages both Israel and Palestine to reach a sustainable negotiated settlement under international law, which has as its foundation mutual recognition and the determination to coexist peacefully. So as we mark Nakba with the distressing scenes that we witnessed this week, it is worth reflecting that peace can only come when human rights are respected, international law is upheld, and all parties join in a genuine peace process that puts the rights of all at its heart. That very basic respect for human rights, presiding officer, is not what happened to the people of Palestine in 1948. And be in no doubt, it is not what is happening to them this week. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the debate and I close this meeting.